As David gives me the thumbs up having peered at our recorder, I welcome you to another episode of the Religious Studies Project. My name is Christopher Cotter, and his name... His name is David Robertson. And his name is Thomas J. Coleman. This week, interviewing Bob McCauley on the subject of method and theory in the cognitive science of religion. And to set that up, here's Tommy. Welcome to the Religious Studies Project. I am Thomas Coleman, and I am joined here today by uh, Dr. Robert McCauley at the North American Association for the Study of Religion 2015 conference. And Dr. McCauley is currently the William Rand Keenan Jr. Professor uh, at Emory University, and he is also the director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture at Emory. Uh, this is Dr. McCauley's second time sitting down with the Religious Studies Project for a podcast. His first podcast, uh, which is one of our most popular ever, I, I think the title may have had something to do with this. Uh, it was Religion is Natural and Science is Not, discussing uh, some of his research in his book on the naturalness of religious belief. Um, uh, Today, I'm going to invite him to discuss some methodological and theoretical topics in the cognitive science of religion and related disciplines. Uh, Dr. McCauley, welcome to the Religious Studies Project. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Rumor has it that you have two book projects coming out soon. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to give a brief plug for those. Uh, Tell the RSP listeners what to expect. (laughs) Um, Well, the one that uh, I hope to uh, finish soon is uh, a um, a compilation of a number of related papers about philosophical issues that are occasioned by the very prospect of a cognitive science of religion. And uh, perhaps if uh, this is the 25th year in Nasser, it's also the 25th, most people some people at least have argued that it's the 25th year into the sort of uh, the, the viable cognitive science of religion. Um, the uh, So there are a few of the essays that will be in the book that come from things that were published in the past, uh, a couple co-authored with Tom Lawson. Um, they're not so easy to find, but they uh, are certainly available out there. But um, rather than having to sort of scour journals to find them, uh, the hope is we'll bring those or you know, I'll bring those all together with uh, a couple of uh, original papers uh, hmm. that will go into the volume as well. Um, uh, five of the chapters really deal with sort of our, our more philosophical papers. Uh, the final chapter, after sort of uh, looking at at least five different philosophical angles, you might say, I suppose, on the cognitive science of religion and its possibility and its implications uh, and its uh possible contributions, um, is uh, a final chapter that just simply reviews uh, uh, some of the findings. Uh, And at one level, um, although there is tremendous amounts of philosophical discussion about it to this day, uh, one kind of argument about its worth is simply to point out the kinds of uh, accomplishments that have already uh, uh, been achieved in the research in the field. Um, so that, that's the first project. Um, I would like to tell you I have a settled title for it, but I'm afraid I uh, haven't come to an absolutely settled title. I've been been toying with the idea of Head Start, uh, but uh, uh, you probably know I ought not to take more time to explain that. Let me charge ahead. The, the second project is um, a book that uh, is tentatively entitled Gods in Disorder. Um, and it's a project that is uh, I'm pursuing collaboratively with a, a colleague uh, here in Atlanta George, at Georgia State University, uh, George Graham, who's in the philosophy department at Georgia State. George is the uh, uh, sometimes referred to as sort of, uh, if not the father, then one of the fathers of philosophical uh, uh, or the philosophy of psycho, uh, psychopathology. And uh, in short, the project is one that looks at uh, the 
I mean, this is not new to us, the obvious affinities that uh, uh, about certain kinds of experiences that people have in some contexts that are uh, uh, taken as evidence that they indeed suffer from mental disorders. Uh, and uh, by contrast, uh, in other contexts are oftentimes actually treated as fairly routine, unproblematic, and indeed almost expected uh, forms of religious experience, at least in a few settings. Um, and what we're interested in is um, whether or not the tools of cognitive science broadly, and particularly the tools that the cognitive science of religion has deployed, uh, as to say some of the tools that it has uh, particularly selected out of that toolbox mm. that's available, um, may uh, provide some grounds for, um, uh, rather than, and I, I should say this, rather than exoticizing religion, but rather more domesticating um, uh, mental disorder uh, and, and to look at it uh, in terms of certain sorts of cognitive capacities that are, uh, and cognitive systems that are, um, uh, uh, either impaired in their functioning or uh, altered in ways that oftentimes prove to be unhelpful to the person in question. But um, uh, but indeed, one of the things, you know, uh, is that in fact, it's not always uh, unhelpful. Um, and religious settings are certainly one of the settings in which it quite frequently is the case that it is that it's not unhelpful. Uh, so that, that, broadly speaking, is the project. Uh, we'll defend a position that we call ecumenical naturalism. Uh, and that's simply to say that we're ecumenical in our naturalism, <laughs> in short. Uh, that's, uh, that's a great segue uh, to the first question here. Uh, you're talking about ecumenical naturalism. I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, what is naturalism? Uh, how does it differ from, say, supernaturalism or other epistemological positions, and what does this mean for cognitive science of religion? And, and you know, to some extent, why am I asking you this question? It might seem funny for, uh, you know, if I was interviewing someone about chemistry, um, you know, to ask them why naturalism was important. Well, uh, uh, I think that uh, I've always worn uh, two research hats. Uh, one is as a fairly uh, theoretically oriented cognitive scientist, and that's uh, with a principal interest in the, the sorts of behaviors and forms of mental life and social patterns and so on that we're likely to sort of pick out in cultures and call religions. Um, but I'm, you know, interested in the cognitive science of science as well. Uh, but the other hat I've worn, and that's as a philosopher, and a philosopher of cognitive science at the same time. Uh, so there's a, there's a sort of answer about naturalism in the philosophical context, and there's an answer about naturalism in the uh, CSR context, the uh, cognitive science of religion. Um, in the philosophical context, uh, the um, uh, naturalistic orientation is one that simply argues that uh, philosophy, at least in the West, has had a long history of spawning sciences, that uh, once those sciences have been spun off, as it were, out of uh, philosophical speculation um, and have taken on, indeed, separate identities of their own. They're no longer natural philosophy, but rather physics or chemistry or biology and so on. Um, that uh, philosophers uh, of a variety of stripes, quite frankly, uh, seem to take a certain amount of umbrage at the notion that those sciences might actually come back and uh, lay claim to making positive assertions about uh, some of the domains that philosophy thought was its privileged territory. Uh, I suppose the two, that, that's everything from speculations about cosmology all the way through, uh, say, for example, in the early 19th century, um, all the way through to our own time in terms of philosophical speculations about mind or about language or about culture. Uh, a naturalist um, in this domain is one who is committed to the view that philosophy, that uh, is inattentive to those sciences and the work that they do and the findings that they've come 
uh, arrived at uh, is philosophy done probably less responsibly than it could be done. Uh, uh, it's not to say that it's done badly. Uh, it's just to say that uh, it could even perhaps be improved by uh, attention to uh, um, the actual science. Uh, to use uh, one illustration, um, uh, from you know the early 19th century, there were uh, philosophers who uh, pronounced, uh, you know, inspired by Kant, that uh, it was an a priori truth that there were seven planets in the solar system. Uh, well, it's not an a priori truth that there are seven planets in the solar system, and uh, uh, you know now with some historical distance, it's easy enough to see that and uh, see the sort of philosophical error that are involved and the suggestion is now that in our time when we have social cognitive and brain sciences that pronouncements about the way mental life has to be uh, may in fact be subject to the same kind of correction and, and, and at least constraint on the, on the religion side um, I suppose you know, picking up on your term about, you know, what's the difference between this and supernaturalism? And um, I, I, I don't know exactly what I'd say about that, except <laughs> to say that, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know that there are many supernaturalists out there uh, in the academic study of religion, but, uh, um, but it is a view that says, let's um, uh, say naturalistic orientation is one that says that religion is... Um, not to be accepted uh, uh, amongst the range of human mental um, conduct and not to be uh, treated as an exception in terms of people's behaviors, that it's uh, a part of, of human cognitive and conscious and mental life, and it's a part of uh, and has a place and, and um, have has characteristic uh, behaviors and, and that are of a piece with all others and that the tools of the sciences that are used to study mental life and behavior are just as appropriate in this domain as in any other. Um, in that regard, there certainly is a claim religion is not special. Uh, and so I guess that would take, I would take to be the, the, the sort of the quite specific application of that more general sort of philosophical orientation as it's brought to bear on the study of religion. Um, in some of your previous research, you have discussed and defended explanatory pluralism uh, in the study of religion, noting that for any given phenomena, different levels of explanation uh, can be applied. Uh, what are these different levels of explanation, and how is each level related to the next uh, in terms of the object or phenomena religion? Um. Uh, it is correct that I have uh, defended a uh, position that I've I dubbed about 30 years ago explanatory pluralism. I should say that the position uh, arises out of my the side of my research that has to do in the, with the philosophy of science. I mean, my major interest has been in uh, what I would call questions of cross scientific relations uh, in the traditional. Um, uh, literature in the philosophy of science, this was typically referred to as reduction. Um, the uh, explanatory pluralist uh, simply maintains that uh, there is no such thing as a complete explanation. There is no such thing as a final explanation. There is no such thing as a full explanation in any of science. Uh, that each analytical level uh, in science has um, uh, tools and insights uh, that can be brought to bear on any given phenomenon of interest, including religion or features of religion or aspects of religion. Uh, but likewise, uh, you know, likewise with regard to any other object of study in science. Um, as to, uh, you know, what the levels are, uh, they can be uh, differentiated on finer or more coarse grains. Uh, I guess I personally uh, have been willing to defend at least a fairly coarse-grained uh, differentiation between uh, what I would 
say, are the physical sciences, the families, uh, the family of the physical sciences, uh, the family of the biological sciences, the family of the broadly psychological sciences, and the, the family of the sociocultural sciences. And uh, the presumption is, is that there is a sort of hierarchy there that I've moved from quite general sciences that address all events to increasingly narrow subsets of all events. Um, so every event that is a biological event is also a physical event, but not every event that's a physical event is a biological event. So there's an asymmetry there. Uh, oftentimes the story that's told about this is a story told um, uh, in terms of sort of Componential or muriological analysis. That is to say that the sort of uh, the stuff at the bottom is the little stuff and you put it together and it makes bigger stuff. So, you know, the physical particles are put together to make things like biological systems. And that at least some kinds of special biological systems are ones that turn out to have psychology, uh, uh, particularly if they've got a biological structure called a brain. Uh, and that if you put a whole bunch of psyches together, you'll get things like societies and cultures. Uh, I I actually don't like that uh, way of approaching this question. Um, the notion that sort of the little things are at the most fundamental level and the big things are sort of built up out of them because there are plenty of big things that are discussed at the mm -hmm. fundamental level um, from uh, the weather to uh, which is to say that these are parts of the family of the physical sciences, uh, the dis you know discussion of the weather and the planets and uh, um, earthquakes and 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 uh, the entire uh, as it were the entire universe. Uh, so I, I I think that's not such a helpful way to look at it. I think there are other ways of of suggesting that there's a, a sort of principled. Um, uh, order to, for lack of a better term, let's say a hierarchy of the levels. Um, uh, one of them has to do with the age of the systems in question, uh, which is to say that uh, the physical sciences address the stuff, as it were, that on our best theories about uh, change over time in, in the world uh, was the stuff that we know was there first. Uh, and it takes a long time before there's anything that counts as biology. Just talking about like matter here. Literally, right. yes, right. matter exactly. Uh, indeed, the sub, you know, the the, the, the atomic and subatomic components of matter. Uh, I mean, within instances, you know, within fractions of uh, of a second after the Big Bang, there are some things that exist, and then there are other things that take literally billions of years before they exist, like biological systems, and at least, you know, how how uh, liberal one wants to be about what sorts of what sorts of things qualify as having psychologies. I think it's fair to say that we are agreed that, uh, or at least there's widespread consensus, let's put it that way, that it, it probably is going to require another at billion or so years before you get anything remotely close to anything. I would say probably a couple of billion years before you get anything even vaguely as a candidate. But probably more measured in let's say, maybe even just a few million years. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of things that count as societies, um, uh, I mean, large-scale societies, large-scale groups amongst humans are measured in just a few thousand years. Uh, I mean, large-scale societies didn't arise until the birth of agriculture, and agriculture is probably no more than ten or 11,000 years old. Uh, so that, that's a way of making that case for the levels and for their arrangement. Um, um, it's, it's a fairly rough and ready characterization, and I would concede that straight away. Um, as to the relations between them... Uh, where does the humanities kind of cognitive science relationship fit into that? Well, I think that it's... Uh, I mean, what I've so far mostly described is, in fact what I've called families of sciences. Um, where do the, uh, the materials and the methods of the humanists fit in? Well, they fit in principally at those top two levels. They engage in each of the, with each of those. Um, they use different methods. Um, uh, that is to say, top two levels are the psychological sciences and the sociocultural sciences. Um, they uh, 
provide a wealth of concepts uh, that, frankly, quite routinely gets theorizing sort of started, uh, both in terms of the way those concepts uh, divvy up the psychological world, our sort of, you know, one would say our folk psychology, and, and frankly, likewise, our folk sociology. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also provide us a, a, a collection of at least what we find, tend to find our intuitively plausible theories um, about sort of how those things relate to one another. Uh, that is to say, how psychological states uh, uh, interact with one another causally and interact with, uh, you know, uh, to produce behavior and, and, um, and interactions between humans and so on. Um, the... Um, so the, the argument is minimally uh, the humanistic disciplines provide us with um, uh, conceptual frameworks both for sort of how we at least as a first pass uh, make sense of the psychological and make sense of the social or at least how we try to sort of and then also primordial theories about uh, the dynamics involved at those levels uh, of reality. Um, I think also, frankly, the humanities have long traditions of bluntly wisdom and uh, and insight. And uh, frankly, I hardly know an outstanding cognitive scientist who isn't inspired in uh, on a f- um, at least a periodic basis by uh, the candid, pithy insights that that the humanities have just routinely generated and, uh, and and the arts as well quite frankly um, so they are a spurs to uh, um, theorizing that I think are quite valuable often um, as to the, to go back to the kind of technical question about the relationship between levels um, in the might be a good time to sneak in kind of sure. the, the next question, which which I think will relate to that. Uh, I, I hope uh, you know, if uh, if the overall scientific endeavor kind of constrains the categories and processes by which the humanities understand the mind, um, particularly in the case of religion, what are these constraints and, and processes, and what is the role of the humanities scholar kind of? in this model, if, if the sociocultural sciences are at the top uh, and just below kind of the surface there you have the psychological and brain sciences, uh, well, what is the specific interplay, uh, some perhaps constraints uh, on categories that are imposed at a lower level? Um. Uh, okay, that introduces, that com- makes this discussion a little more complex. I was going to just uh, sort of explicate it at a, at a kind of fairly straightforward <laughs> philosophical uh, analysis. Nothing but, is straightforward. <laughs> uh, very little, that's right. Um, uh, yeah, what you're saying, I mean, in short, I suppose this really goes back to my earlier comments about naturalism, and that is to the extent that uh, philosophy, but also an awful lot of religious studies and lots of work in the humanities uh, is uh, done more profitably if it's informed by work in the relevant sciences that might bear on the phenomena that are being discussed. So I take it that's uh, what probably best informs the, the this new part of the question that you've introduced. Um, uh, I suppose that, I mean, there are lots of examples. Uh, I, um, uh, one hardly knows where to begin, Uh, but let's, let's pick a, um, uh, I think a big one, and that is memory. Uh, There are, and it's a perfect illustration of areas where, um, it seems to me the humanities have had lots of insight about these matters. Um, but it turns out there are some surprises when you start doing the science of memory. Um, and, uh, and indeed, um, it's, it's a very, very complex matter because memory is probably 47 different things uh, in 
depending on context, depending on uh, modalities, depending on uh, the cognitive tasks in question. Yeah, context is multiple levels of context. I mean, not just the material context or the cultural context or the social context, but, um, you know, sort of the problem context as well. Um, uh the research on uh, memory shows us that, first of all, um, and again, there are plenty of humanists out there who have sort of thought, uh, have advanced ideas not unlike this. But, of course, what happens when you're able to do the science, and particularly the experimental science, is that you begin to provide um, systematic, uh, controlled studies that, uh, offer evidence for some of these. So, for example, uh, memory, uh, which we so often think of in terms of sort of issues of retrieval, for example, uh, you know, retrieving some uh, memory. I can remember exactly what it was like that day, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, well, I mean, the bottom line is, is that it turns out that we're really not very good at this uh, and that we typically don't remember exactly what it was like that day and that an awful lot of it is reconstructed on the basis of generalized scripts, for example, that we have available to us and that we develop in the course of our experience. Um, that uh, emotion and its connections with memory. And, of course, if I can cut right to the chase with regard to, say, something like ritual. Uh, you know, there are some rituals that are routine and boring, but there are some rituals that are highly arousing and, and emotionally exciting. Um, it has a variety of, of um, um, impacts on uh, uh, memory and uh, depending on context and it turns out although when we're emotionally aroused uh, we tend to think these must be pretty important events they've gotten our attention uh, especially if it's sustained and if there's a cultural story that is tacked onto it that tells us those are emotional or sorry that those are important events in subsequent weeks and days or days and weeks and months and years of our lives uh, you know you've gotten married, and that's a fundamental change in the, uh, the sexual and reproductive landscape out there. That's a f big deal, right? And, 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 we're, and so we take that, what is often an emotional event, uh, Celebration. to participate in a wedding um, as uh, something that can help with this kind of cultural uh, support. Um, build and consolidate a, uh, a set of memories. Uh, but of course, what the scientists can do is use a variety of measures and ways to ascertain, for example, things like the accuracy of memory, of memory um, uh, to uh, measure things like people's confidence in their levels of their memory. Uh, and frankly, um, uh, to anticipate a bit, um, the, um, uh, it seems to me that this is one area where the cognitive science of religion has had really interesting findings. Uh, um, in some ways, it's uh, precisely with regard to memory, it's in some ways the, one of the most successful areas and one of the least successful areas. Uh, that is to say, we've had some hypotheses that have been out there that are look like they really stand, which is the argument for the mnemonic advantages of so-called minimally counterintuitive representations. Um, but uh, there is research on what I was just discussing, and that is ritual and high levels of emotion and emotional arousal. And, uh, you know, there were speculations advanced by myself, uh, Tom Lawson, Harvey Whitehouse, um, in uh, suspecting that that rituals may in fact end up embodying these high arousal rituals, uh, a host of conditions that may result in something that looks quite like what's in the technical literature called a flashbulb memory. Um, and it looks like that probably isn't true. Uh, and to the extent that it is, it's uh, contrary to what we were sort of speculating. It's not so much a memory for uh, the ritual as it is, the, that is to say, the, the, the process of the ritual as it is for um, certain kinds of uh, consequences of the ritual. Um, but there's some great research that's just been done and published in the last few years uh, about high arousal rituals. And uh, one of the findings, uh, famously, of, of uh, the firewalkers in Spain is, is that uh, as soon as they're done with their ritual, they claim they don't remember anything at all. 
Interesting. Uh, and it's a highly arousing ritual, let me assure you. Um, but um, uh, when they're tested in a longer retention interval, which is to say over, a, you come back a couple of months later and you ask them uh, what they remember, uh, they claim to remember all kinds of things and they claim to have extremely high confidence levels about their memory. They're quite positive that they remember a host of details about it. But of course, these researchers have done very careful experimental work. They have a record, literally a video record and an audio record of the event as it occurred. And it turns out Although they have this incredibly high confidence level, the fact of the matter is they're almost dead wrong about every detail they te are tested on. <laughs> um, I hope that that's material that can be of aid to humanists and their interests uh, as they approach these kinds of materials. Uh, I, I, I could provide other illustrations. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, with regard to belief, uh, so much of our time is spent focused on texts and doctrines and when we look at religion and um, uh, from a cognitive level, when people are out there sort of operating in the world, it turns out that although um, overtly, if you ask them, they may well do things like recite doctrines to you that they've uh -huh. memorized and so on. When you use subtle cognitive measures for sort of seeing how, in fact, their cognitive processing operates, it turns out that these doctrines and these sorts of, uh, you know, fairly fancy theological conceptions, um, in fact, don't seem to have play a very significant role in how they carry out inference, for example. So we can't just, uh, you know, think of because someone has a text or a set of ideas or, or beliefs that those necessarily and always inform their behavior. Exactly. Um, in every case, perhaps they do, but many times, uh, you know, as you're talking about in terms of the case of memory, they don't. Yeah, and, and, and uh, an awful lot of mental, I've just used uh, <laughs> finger scare quotes, quotes when I said this, air quotes, yes, uh, their mental behavior as well. As I said, the kinds of inferences that they carry out uh, uh, in religious contexts. Yeah. Uh, so again, um, uh, the cognitive science of religion, I take it, provides uh, some information that can be useful in kind of uh, helping to inform and perhaps constrain uh, the kinds of speculations that humanists are willing and ought to entertain uh, um, uh, about a host of issues uh, in connection with both religious belief and religious behavior and religious practices and so on. Uh, I know we got to get you out of here soon uh, and get on the road, but kind of a, a final question here uh, before leaving is wondering how much explanatory weight should the cognitive science of religion place on cognitive architecture or kind of the, again, air quotes again, the, the mental stuff uh, versus more like cultural level, cultural learning. Um, what is the, what's the interplay there? Um, I think that the answer is, is that both are involved in just about everything. Uh, um, Tom Lawson and I, when uh, we wrote our first book, we used the language of uh, redressing an imbalance. Uh, an imbalance that uh, in the approaches to religion that were out there seemed to favor uh, um, broadly what you might call presumptions about cultural learning, uh, that uh, this was material that is acquired and um, perhaps even, if I can use the ever so charged term, I am, you know, sort of impressed on a blank slate. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, there are many, many sorts of, of findings in the cognitive sciences over the last 40 years that um, uh, help us understand how human minds work. Uh, and in some regards and in some areas, in some kind of dealing with some kinds of problems and inquiring certain kinds of knowledge, the human mind does look, in some regards, like it's a blank slate. But then there are plenty of other areas where there seems to be really fairly compelling evidence that that's not the case. Uh, 
And so one of the questions that we uh, have uh, envisioned, uh, I, I'm willing to say this, 25 years ago, but another, uh, lots of other folks have done much better jobs of addressing is precisely uh, amidst all of the diversity of culture, amidst all of the diversity of religion, amidst all of the um, uh, plentiful uh, uh, um, uh, difference that uh, is so readily apparent, uh, might there be underlying uniformity? Uh, not in every regard, uh, but in some regards. And for the purposes of seeing, giving an account of some features, remember where I started, there are no such things as complete explanations. There are no such things as full explanations. Um, the cognitive scientists, uh, or the cognitive sciences are uh, but one, and I'm an explanatory pluralist, but one of many possible contributors to our understanding of the phenomena that can be described and, and to some extent explained at multiple levels in, in this hierarchy of, of inquiries in science. Um, for... Um, there, there, let me back up and make another comment, and that is, although I think there are what I've called maturationally natural systems, uh, other of my colleagues are inclined to use language like evolved cognition. Uh, some people have even willing to say things are innate. Uh, um, even, even if innate is true, uh, whatever that means, um, there isn't any question that culture tunes these systems, uh, and it's, it's transparent in the most straightforward parade case, and that's natural language, mm -hmm. which is where the, many of the strongest claims have been made about nativism, about innateness, um, going back to Chomsky all the way in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, if you're born in Norway, you learn to speak Norwegian. If you take that baby and bring it to America, it'll probably learn to speak English. Uh, it isn't going to, you know, I mean, uh, that's culture tuning uh, what is, it looks like a constrained and largely canalized kind of system, but, but not completely. Uh, uh, in other work I've done with other colleagues, um, you know, Joe Henrik and I published a paper together in which we were pointing out that uh, there's evidence that culture even tunes something as fundamental as the human visual system. Um, so it's a constant interplay, and it's, you know, Excuse me. It's quite regularly, and I mean, the point is, it's an these are empirical questions, and um, there isn't some principled answer that settles these things in advance. I mean, you've got to go do the studies. You've got to go look at the world, uh, and oftentimes, what science so wonderfully does is surprise us. Um, do you have anything? You'd like to close on any closing notes of wisdom in terms of oh my. what, what we <laughs> discussed here, um, and, and we'll we'll fade out on that. Let's fade out on science surprises us. Science surprises us all. You heard it, Dr. McCauley. Thank you very much for joining okay. us on the Religious Studies Project. Thanks so much for another wonderful interview there, Tommy, um, which was facilitated um, at the AAR conference this year by the North American Association for the Study of Religions, who are our co-sponsor, along with the British Association for the Study of Religions. So um, do remember those two fantastic organizations every time you're listening to the Religious Studies Project. Um, and both very fruitful um, collaborations there, not only handing over some money, but, you know, setting up these recordings, suggesting people, letting us into conferences and so on. It's, it's, uh, it's heartwarming is what it is. Absolutely. And um, David and I, um, this week, are going to be heading down to Wolverhampton for a BASR Executive Committee meeting, uh, because in, in our one of our many other lives, we are also involved in the running of the BASR. <laughs> um, and Wolverhampton is where the 2016 conference is going to be. So Stephen Gregg is going to be taking us around the conference venue. And we might, of course, have to sample some of the local um, hostelries as well. Just to... there, might, there might be some time to kill. So we'll uh... But um, look out for next week's intros being recorded somewhere in Wolverhampton. If we don't forget, there is always the possibility <laughs> that we're going to forget. Um, but, you know, fingers crossed. And um, there'll be lots of... Um, 
plotting, no doubt, about what exactly the RSP will be doing at the BASR conference in Wolverhampton this year. And I'm already um, planning our next Christmas special. You've probably only just recovered from this year's (laughs) one. Exactly. I don't think we could ever top that in terms of uh, scale, at least. I don't think we'd have that many people at the BASR conference. No, but, uh, you know, there's, there's other ways of intensity other than sheer numbers. Exactly. So next week, we're delighted to welcome back David McConaughey, uh, who's speaking with Aaron Hughes, um, who is the vice president of uh, NASA, and they're speaking about um, sort of religious studies as a discipline, um, particularly focusing upon Aaron's work, taking a critical approach to Islamic studies and that whole area studies melange. Mm-hmm. Something we've talked a few times about in this, but uh, yeah, the gradual uh, dissipation of uh, religious studies as a discipline into a series of well I don't want to say ghettos but uh, you know mm. area studies all fenced off from each other and not really speaking and all using similar uh, uncritical methodologies yeah which is interesting um, given um, what Aaron and Russell were saying in Brad's interview about how you know the, the, the Nasser theme, this year was theory in a time of excess, how a lot of graduate students, um, David recently, myself, and, and basically everyone that we, we know are being produced to claim method and theory as a thing that they do. And, and it seems that now that these graduate students are being produced, simultaneously the industry is moving towards an area studies focus where method and theory is no longer um, something that will necessarily get you a job. So it's well, we'll see how it shakes out. It may mean that people like me fall into area studies jobs anyway. But if we go into it with more of an understanding um, of method and theory and of the um, the problems of that sort of ghettoization, then the next generation after that might be able to shake things up back in the other direction a little bit more. Yeah. Shake things up. Yeah. Um, if you rattle want, those cages. <laughs> you can, people like to rattle cages on social media. Uh, and you can rattle cages on our social media feeds Google Plus, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, YouTube. Indeed. It's been going well this last week. I've really enjoyed it. Um, Bob listens to Religious Studies Project on YouTube. Bob is aware of issues of method and theory. Be like Bob. No comment. Remember about Amazon, give us a rating, and thanks for listening. I'm sorry. <laughs>